By turning the purpose of your life into one of service and leaving behind your self-absorption, you discover the irony of manifesting. The more you choose to be of service, the more profoundly you experience unconditional love and the more you find materializing into your life. Service is best thought of as a continuous focus in your life rather than being limited to certain kinds of giving activities. Service is a state of mind that expresses love rather than fear, trust rather than distrust. It focuses on meeting all others as equals with whom we share a spiritual identity. This inner attitude of love reveals itself in action. Service does not require that you become a Mother Teresa. You serve by suspending your ego and extending the love that fills that space. It can take a million different forms, but when practiced with authenticity from the heart, it makes all that is manifested into your life worthwhile. The only problem you will encounter is attempting to give or serve without love. Service without love is obligation, and it carries guilt and anger and resentment along with it. Work at being in a state of unconditional love with your service efforts, and when love is not authentically present, acknowledge that as well. You get back from the universe, from the world, what it is that you put out there in the world. If your message to the universe is gimme, 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 which is a lot of people's message to the universe. I want this from you, I want that from you, please give me this, I have to have that. That's what their prayer is like, that's what their message is, you know, and they say, I want this from the universe, give me, give me, give me. The universe's response back to that kind of a uh, mentality is exactly the same. The universe will say right back to you over and over again, give me, give me, give me. And the interesting thing about all of this, the, the irony of this, is that if you shift that, and you say to the universe, to the world, how may I serve? How may I serve? The universe's response back to you is, how may I serve you? How may I serve you? And it's very intriguing. When you take your energy and your attention off of what you are demanding from the world, and instead saying, what can I give to the world? It comes from your saying to the universe and to the world, what can I do for you? How may I serve you? Life supports life in the same way that you put it out there. So the irony of all of this is that when you shift into a how may I serve you mentality, you get all of the things that you used to demand from the universe but never seemed to arrive in a sufficient amount because it was always demanding so much more of you. But the moment that you start serving because it will then serve you, you're doing the gimme, gimme, gimme thing. Does that make sense? So you have to shift and not be attached to what it is that you get. And it's really the, the basis behind that very famous line of the, uh, President uh, John Kennedy's uh, inaugural address. Ask not what your country can do, ask what you can do for your country. And the irony of that is, and I've learned that in my own life, that when I stopped thinking about what was in it for Wayne Dyer and how much could I get, and I began to shift and say, how can I help you? How can I give to you? What can I do for you? And people who write to me, uh, I send them something. When, when I encounter somebody that needs help of some kind, I'm very often just giving that to them. And then I find that it just keeps coming back into my life. And once I shifted that energy off of what can I have into what can I give, it seemed to me that the universe responded back with the very same message. What can I give to you? And the most incredible and wonderful and beautiful abundance has flowed into my life in every way that I can possibly think of. You can't give away what you don't have. So take a look at an inventory of what you do have. How much do you love yourself? How much kindness do you have in you? How much peace do you have in you? How much joy do you have in you? And if you're able to give that away as many times as you can in a given day, watch and see how much more of that continues to show up and come back in your life. And if you're putting out there into the world that I am not worthy of attracting something beautiful into my life, that the universe will respond back to you with exactly that message. 
And there are people who come to me and who came to me for years when I had a, a, my own uh, counseling practice and so on, and they would say to me, um, I just keep attracting the same kind of people, the same kind of events, the same kind of uh, losers into my life. Why is that? Why do I keep doing that? And I keep attracting uh, an absence of, uh, of abundance. I just can't seem to attract abundance into my life. I'm always behind the eight ball. I'm never getting ahead. <clears throat> and I suggest to them, I said, did it ever occur to you that that's the very kind of message you're sending out to the world and out to the universe? So many people are consumed by their past and living as if the things that happen to them in their life are the reasons why their life isn't going the way they would like it to go today. I'd like to suggest to you that in this principle, which I call giving up your personal history, I'd like to suggest to you that all of that is uh, wonderful to talk about in therapy, and you can get a lot of help, literally, for uh, going back and examining the things in your past that uh, perhaps are troubling for you. But the illusion is that these are the things or the reasons why your life is not working the way you would like it to work today. That is the illusion. It's the illusion that Alan Watts spoke about when he used the metaphor of the wake of the boat. That the wake of a boat is nothing more than the trail that is left behind. If you stand on the back of a speedboat and watch it, it's a wonderful metaphor. You can get that picture in your head. You can simply see how it is all just a trail that is left behind. And if you ask yourself, what's driving the boat? What's making it go forward? The answer is that what's making it go forward is the present moment energy that is being generated by the engine in this moment, now. And that's the only thing that can make the boat go forward. And the most important question to ask yourself about this little metaphor is, is it possible for the wake to drive the boat? Can a wake, that is, can a trail that is left behind make a boat go forward? And of course the answer to that is no, and thus it is also true for your life. That the wake of your life is also a trail that is left behind. And this trail that is left behind is just that. It is not what is making you inefficient, poor, unhappy, depressed, stressful, sick, uh, in bad relationships, and so on. Even though we like to think that and we like to put the responsibility for those things on all of these events that took place in our past, the fact is, the way I look at the past, is that everything that happened to us in the past had to happen in order for us to be where we are today. And the evidence that I have for that is that it did. <laughs> and there's nothing else to say about it. It did, and it can't be undone. A thousand years ago, a man named Omar Khayyam, who was a tent maker in the Muslim world, observed the moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on nor all thy piety nor wit can lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out one word of it. He knew that in the Middle Ages. And yet we've got people who are consumed with the belief that because of the way you treated me, because of what you said to me, because of how I was abandoned, because of how I was abused, because of how I was ignored, because of my past, that I lived in uh, this particular set of circumstances or that, that these are the reasons why my life is not going the way I would like it to go today. And if there's any advice that I think will help you to get onto the extra mile where it's not very crowded. It came to me from a man named uh, Carlos Castaneda, who I was reading something that he had written in a book called uh, The Fire From Within. And he said, one day 
I finally realized that I no longer needed a personal history. He said, and just like drinking, I gave it up. And he said, that and only that has made all the difference in my life. So that all of these things and all of these events that transpired, that took place up until now, all you can, you can do them is thank you. And I'm talking about all of it. Thank you for abandoning me. Thank you for the abuse. Thank you for the struggles. Thank you for all of it because it is out of those falls and out of those struggles and all of those difficulties that I generated the energy to propel myself to a higher place. And without those falls, without those struggles, without those difficulties, I wouldn't be able to get to the place I am today. How you process and, and perceive yourself is determined not by what other people tell you, as much as you'd like to believe that, but in fact by how you have chosen to process yourself. And what you want to learn how to do right off the bat, at the very beginning, is to understand that disliking yourself or experiencing self-rejection or putting yourself down or finding fault with yourself or looking at your body and telling yourself all the things about it that you don't like. Like you may be too tall, you might tell yourself that you're too short, you might tell yourself that you're too heavy, that you're too light, that you're any number of things and you can go through every organ in your body and some people do this very thing and find all kinds of reasons why they don't like this, they don't like that, they don't like the size of their, their legs, they don't like the size of their breasts, they don't like the way their hair is, they don't like their eyes, they don't like their ears, their nose is too big, they're, it's an endless and this is like uh, a burden that you place on yourself in your life and it's something that you want to really begin to process in a different way and a way to process it is to say uh, what do I get out of this what's the what's the point in me disliking myself or finding fault with myself it's the only self I have instead of doing that and uh, keeping myself miserable what I'm going to do is uh, look in the mirror and say to myself, this is the body that I have shown up in for whatever reason, whether it was my plan, or whether it was God's plan, whether it was my parents' plan, whether it was a conspiracy, whatever, it is still the reality. And I am going to accept the reality of what I have shown up in and see it as my curriculum to a higher place. The body that you're in, whether it's in a wheelchair, whether it's blind, whether it's deaf, whether it's tall, whether it's short or black, white, whatever it may be, it is still your curriculum. It's what you have to use to get to the highest place that you want to be in your life. So rejecting it is really rejecting your entire life curriculum. Uh, and you have to really look at the, the whole idea of, in our culture, it's almost... I think I have been asked the question on talk shows across America more about this particular subject than anything else. And the question is, isn't it selfish? Aren't you promoting selfishness? Aren't you telling people that uh, they should love themselves and reject all other people and so on. And I'd like to put that to rest right here. The first thing you have to ask yourself is what does it mean to be selfish? To be selfish is to be a burden to another human being. Whenever you find yourself a burden to somebody else or someone else is a burden to you, that is a very selfish act. The person who dislikes himself, believe it or not, is the biggest burden to be around in the world. This is someone who is never happy, doesn't know how to make themselves happy, is using other people to uh, try to get them to be happy, is always blaming other people for uh, the, the, the conditions of their life. Uh, the person who has self-doubt or self-rejection uh, uh, doesn't know how to enjoy their life. And being around a person who doesn't enjoy their life is burdensome. The person who does love themselves, who feels good about themselves, who, if you ask the question, do you love yourself, there's not even an issue there. There's not even a question involved. It's simply, of course I do. This is, this is me. This is all I have. Of course I love myself. Why wouldn't I? Why would I ever put myself down? It has nothing to do with uh, being conceited or finding fault with other people or uh, uh, making yourself better than anybody else. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the simple notion that in order for me to be happy, I have to love myself. In order to be able to uh, be free from being a burden to somebody else, 
I have to know how to enjoy my life. If I know how to enjoy my life, it means that I am loving the life that I'm having, and that means I'm loving the body that I'm in, I'm loving the self that I am, and therefore you will not be a burden to anybody else. The person who loves themselves is never a burden to anyone else unless it's conceit, and conceit is just another form of trying to get other people to pay more attention to you. But if it's just authentic self-acceptance, then it is, it is the most important thing that you can do. And in raising children, nothing is more important in the whole educational environment than self-concept, self-esteem. This is what we're trying to teach all the time to young people, is feel good about yourself. Treat yourself, cherish yourself as a, as a valuable, important, significant, grand, divine creature, <laughs> as someone who is unique and special in all the world and feel that way about yourself wherever you go and carry yourself that way. So you have to say to yourself, they didn't do it to me. I allowed it to happen and I am no longer willing to allow myself to be immobilized by the rejection that other people or other events or other institutions or whatever it may be may have uh, attempted to impose on me. So what you want to do at this point is, is if, you, if you can see that that, that there are areas of your life in which you are self-rejecting and identify them and make a commitment to changing them, then you can come up with some specific things that you can do about it. You can begin to, to discipline yourself to select new responses to others' attempts uh, at, at, making you feel, um, at making you feel good. When someone says to you, uh, gee, you look really nice today, you can practice instead of that immediate self-rejecting kind of oh, it really isn't me, or this is my hairdresser, or whatever, you can, you can just, a, a very simple thank you, or it's nice to know that, uh, that you appreciate me. Just, even if you don't mean it, I mean, just, sometimes you have to fake it, but faking it is all right, as long as you are practicing a kind of, hey, I'm, you yeah, know, if someone says to me I look nice, or that I smell good, or that I look nice in this outfit, or that I look younger than I am, or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm entitled to that. I'm entitled to a compliment. I'm worth that. You can practice saying things like, I love you, and, and check out when someone says that back to you. How do you react to that? What is, the, what is your reaction to that? And accept the I love you's and the caresses and the, and the affection that other people are directing at you as, a, as something that is directed towards someone who deserves that rather than always doubting it and saying, oh, I wonder if he really does that, or I wonder if she really means it, or if, and, and all of the doubting kind of things. I, I, of course you would love me. Your, your attitude, your inner conversation goes, of course you would love me. I'm, I'm worth being loved. I'm a, valuable, I'm a valuable person. Here are a few ideas for putting peace in your life permanently. Thinking of yourself as a peaceful person is the first step, but it is only the first step. The thought must translate into action in order for you to know peace. Work at curbing your inclination to create confrontation and disruption in the lives of others. A simple practice of pausing and asking yourself whether your ego, which loves turmoil, or your higher self, which loves peace, is about to act. That pause will help you to send out a peaceful response, even in situations where you are feeling impatient or misunderstood. In those situations, you will be able to state simply, for example, you are really having a rough day to a hassle clerk rather than I've been waiting for 15 minutes already and I'm really feeling abused. Send out peace by catching yourself and then consulting your loving presence for a response rather than relying on your ego. Practice releasing the emotions of fear and guilt and replacing them with love and forgiveness and kindness. Release the guilt by forgiving yourself and vowing to avoid that kind of conduct in the future. You do not need the guilt unless you're going to allow your ego to continue its dominance over your life forever. For example, Make a list of all the things that keep you from loving yourself. Your list might include being overweight and jealous or nervous or addicted or incompetent or uncoordinated. Then regardless of how much effort it takes, reverse your mental sentences and state that you love yourself while being fat, while being addicted, and so on. This will help you to feel peaceful about the choices you've made and to realize that you are not that body or those desires. You are the invisible chooser. As you become more peaceful with the chooser, you will begin to replace the unhealthy choice in a spirit of love. Examine everything that offends you and see if you can get your ego out of the picture. If hunger and starvation in the world offend you, try shifting to a new awareness. Somehow, 
in some way that I do not comprehend, these things occur in divine order, and so too does my desire to change it exist in divine order. Shed what offends you, and act on your desire to make corrections. There will then be no need to fight. Similarly, if you find someone else's behavior offensive, you are interpreting that behavior from your own self-absorbed position, which is that they shouldn't act the way they do. You choose to be offended, hurt, or angry by their behavior. But they are acting the way they are. Your being offended is your ego talking to you to keep you anxious and upset. If you don't take it personally, and if you see the behavior for what it is, you can work to eradicate the evils of the world unimpeded by your ego's encouragement to be offended. Keep in mind that grievances bring turmoil while communication brings peace. If you want peace in your life, rid yourself of your grievances. The way to shed these grievances is to let go of your own self-absorption and to practice forgiveness rather than revenge. As you let go, you will feel a sense of peace overtaking you. If you are angry towards someone in your life, no matter how difficult you may find it, work at communicating with that person about your aggrieved feelings. Your embarrassment or inner anguish over being wronged is just what your ego wants you to experience, since it will keep you away from your sacred quest and keep you in the clutches of your anxiety-loving ego. Keep this little sentence ready to consult. Judgment and peace are antithetical. A Course in Miracles says the strain of constant judgment is virtually intolerable. It is curious that an ability so debilitating would be so deeply cherished. You must make a daily effort to look upon others without condemnation. Every judgment takes you away from your goal of peace. Your ego loves your judgments because with them you remain in a constant state of anguish and remorse. Keep in mind that you do not define anyone with your judgment. You only define yourself as someone who needs to judge. Judging others with condemnation removes the possibility of your experiencing love. If you can practice just being still rather than condemning, you will get to the bliss I am talking about. You do not have to pretend that you love something that you loathe. Just get still and let the judgment subside. Peace is not found in being right or being hurt or being angry. By all means, work toward righting the wrongs you perceive. But do it with an understanding that an angry heart keeps you from knowing God and the path of your sacred quest. Peace will come to you when you are a healer rather than a judge. Essentially, embracing the truth is welcoming your higher self and coming to know God. All that is not authentic will drop away automatically. Your ego works hard to convince you that you are separate and better than everyone else, and you know that it does not take kindly to your embracing anything that threatens its existence. But remember that this is your inauthentic self, your false self. Deception is going to play a big role in your life when you embrace ego as your guide. Therefore, in order to abandon your reliance on that false self with all of its deception, you will have to make a new agreement with truth. I encourage you to actually write yourself a contract in which you agree to include truth as your companion in your thoughts, in your conversations, and in your life. This is a big challenge and perhaps difficult for you, but it is guaranteed to lead you to the path of your sacred self. Begin by looking honestly and fearlessly at who you are beneath all the surface trappings that you have surrounded yourself with. You have a human storyline, as does every person who has ever lived on this planet. That storyline begins with your conception, continues through your childhood, and all of your personal triumphs and tribulations, right up to this very moment. You know that there is an eternal aspect of you beneath the surface, and that for this part of you, only the truth will suffice. Another new way of being for me is to think of yourself in terms of personal authority, rather than being an authoritarian. Personal authority. A person who has authority never needs to dominate anyone else, ever. Dominating doesn't become necessary. In business, you can have authority. The people who have the most authority are the ones who listen the most, and the ones who are the most conscientious about what do other people have to say. A person in a relationship who has to dominate somebody else and has to make the other person submissive shows that they don't have authority because they're getting their power not from within for themselves but on the basis of who they can control and that never lasts that never lasts the only thing that lasts is having inner power if you will know thyself that's what Shakespeare said know thyself the more you know yourself the more you the more you become honest with yourself uh, honesty becomes just a way of life 
No, I don't think the world necessarily does, but you can't run your world. You can't run your world based upon what the rest of the people in the world want or don't want. To me, honesty is like it's a karma that goes out into the world. How people treat you in the world is their karma. How you react is yours. And what when you react to it with dishonesty, that's what you're putting out into the world, dishonesty. And when you put dishonesty out into the world, that's what's going to come back to you because what goes out is what comes back that all as you sow so shall you reap i mean it's it's in every great uh institution that there is in the world what, whether it's a religion or a philosophy or whatever what you put out is what comes back whatever you plant is what you're going to get back and the more that you put out honesty just because it's what you are because you are being honesty you're not trying to be honest you're just being honesty then that's what will come back to you on a regular basis and when it doesn't You'll just see that as another test for you to pass. For me, it be has become a way of life. It's called serenity instead of acquisitions. The more you try to acquire, the more you try to get, the more you try to collect in your life and evaluate yourself on the basis of that, the less serenity you're going to have. More is less. It's almost a secret of the universe. Serenity means inner peace it means that you can uh, find joy in every moment that you have in your life instead of always looking for it it means that uh, while you are uh, uh, driving along the countryside you know and seeing uh, and instead of saying oh, this is I'm on my way to this point that you can open your eyes and see it with new eyes see see the rolling mountains see the grass see the deer see the sky see you can just stop wherever you are in this second wherever you are and just look around you and you can begin to appreciate just your in, your surroundings and your environment then you can begin to appreciate the people that are in your life and even the ones that are negative and and you're having the most difficulty with you can practice a new way of being with them which is sending them love, sending them flowers, send them books, send them a tape, send them something, and just see what kind of reaction that you get. Super emotional health is just an attitude. An attitude is everything. And it's being personally an, an authority on yourself rather than authoritarian and trying to be domin dominating someone else or to be dominated. And serenity, which is the name of my little girl, my youngest daughter, Serena, um, rather than acquisitions and accumulations and trying to prove yourself that way and when you get that serenity which comes from the way that you think always then you will replace all of the other junk that keeps you back here between six and one on that clock and once you pass it once you get past it you'll never ever be able to go back because the light living in the light is a way of it's a way of being that if you're not there you don't get it yet, but once you see it, and once it begins to take over your life, you can never go back. That, that is your purpose. It isn't, your purpose isn't to try to be loving. Your purpose is to be loved and only have that to give away. I tell people, supposing you went to sleep and you had a dream, and in your dream you had, um, oh, all these different characters, and, and you had all of this money, and you had everything that you wanted in your dream, and then you woke up. And then you look back at your dream, and you became attached to the stuff that you had in your dream. And you said, wait a minute, I want that. There was gold in there. There was silver. There was all of these friends. I had a Ferrari there. I mean, all of this. I got to have that. Somebody would come away and cart you off and put you in a rubber room and say, that was a dream. You can't be attached to that. That's just a thought that you have. That's the way you got to view life. Instead of it being an eight-hour dream, it's an 80-year dream or a 90-year dream. And at the end of the dream, you don't want to be looking back at all of the stuff that you wish you could still have because you can't have it. <laughs> you don't get any of that. So you try to detach yourself now while you're here, while you're alive, from the need to have that stuff. Instead, you just let it sort of all flow. As absurd as it would be for you to be attached to the stuff that you had in your dream... It's that absurd for you to be attached to the stuff that you're having in this dream. <laughs> you have to die while you're alive. Now, that's a very hard concept for people to get. But you have to experience your own death while you're alive. Let me tell you a story. It's a wonderful story. It's an old, ancient story. I'll paraphrase it. There was a, a hunter who lived in India. 
and he would go to Africa every two years, and he would bring back animals and prizes and things like that. Well, one year he took off and he went to the jungle, and he discovered this large enclave inside the jungle, and it was filled with beautiful parrots, beautiful birds, multicolored, and they all talked. And he couldn't get over it. And he put a net out over one of the trees, and he captured one of the parrots. And he put the parrot in a cage. And he brought the parrot back to be with him in India as his pet. And he fed the parrot sunflower seeds, and he fed him rice, and he took wonderful care of him. He was very good. Kept him in the cage. Two years went by, and he talked to the parrot every day. And he said to the parrot, I'm now going back to Africa. Is there anything you would like me to say to your friends back there in the jungle when I'm back there? The parrot said, yes. Tell them that I'm very happy in my cage. Tell them that I'm joyful and that I love being in my cage here with you. Just tell them that. The hunter went back to Africa. He went back to the place in the jungle where he had been two years before. And he told the story. He said, your friend that I took back has a message for you. And the message is that he is happy in his cage, that he is joyful with me, and that he has no regrets. At the instant of hearing that, a bird on one of the branches keeled over and dropped dead. Dropped dead. Stiff. The hunter assumed that he was just filled with sorrow at hearing of what had happened to his uh, friend. So he went back to India, and he told his parrot what had happened. He said, I went back and I did just as you said. And I told them all out there. And at the moment that I told it, apparently one of the parrots was so upset that he had missed you so much that he just dropped dead. And at the instant that that happened, the parrot in the cage keeled over dead. His legs went straight up in the air, and he went stiff. The hunter was beside himself. He, he couldn't figure out how could this happen. And he took the dead parrot out of the cage, opened it up, and threw it out on the woodpile. The instant that the parrot landed on the woodpile, he flew up to the branch. And the hunter said, you tricked me. What is this? I thought you were dead. And the parrot said, my friend was sending me a message. He told me, by his actions, that in order for you to escape from your cage, you must die while you're alive. Okay, now that's an old story. That's an ancient story that's been told over the years. What does it mean? <laughs> I mean, don't you see that this is a cage? That the whole planet is a cage? If you can just stand back far enough and see that we're still restricted by the limitations placed on us as human beings. We're stuck here or maybe in our homes or in wherever we are. We're all in cages. And even though we have more room to manipulate, we may even have a whole planet. We're still sort of in cages. Now, how do you escape from the cage that you're in? You have to die while you're alive. You have to literally experience your own death. All of us have to. All of us are going to die. So why not experience it in advance? And see yourself out of your body, gone, but able to look back at what's going on now. Just like the dream, where you have the dream and you have everything you want, but you're able to look back at it. As you do that, you begin to see the folly, the absurdity, of hanging on to anything, of being attached to anything, of needing anything, of telling yourself that I can't be happy if, from the perspective of having died, but being able to look back on it just like the dream. As soon as you can do that, as soon as you can experience yourself formless, dimensionless, form and all of the attendant things that you hang on to become irrelevant. They're not necessary any longer. You have a whole new way of living, a new way of being.